Good evening. Uh, welcome to this month's edition of the uh, EMI, which is the Economy, Markets and Investments uh, update from Sundaram Mutual's end. Uh, since we had the budget, union budget presented this month, uh, naturally we will spend a significant amount of time on the impact of the union budget and assessment of the budget and uh, uh, what direction it gives to the market. And as I was saying that we will focus a little bit on the impact of the union budget. But before that, I'd like to set the context for the whole thing. As we are aware, the stock market essentially delivers returns to investors through uh, the discounting of the future earnings growth and hence the expectation built around that, which in turn is a function of the economy, the sector of the company and the company's performances. So obviously we don't delve deep into sector and company in our outlooks. We will deal in detail with the economy's expected performance. At the same time, uh, prices in the stock market are driven by rising and falling demand for stocks, which comes essentially from two sources, from foreign investors and domestic investors. So these are the three I've highlighted in gray, three aspects that we will be covering today. So when you look at the uh, union budget, let's look at the status of the economy leading up to the budget, because where the economy is makes a big difference to what the budget is going to do. So from our perspective of that, I've chosen to show you the snapshot which was published in the economic survey presented a day before the budget. The center is the GDP growth. The economic survey gives you the trends for the last four years. And as you can see there, uh, whether it's the GDP growth or the breakup of the GDP between services, industry, and agriculture, or it's inflation, or it's forex reserves, or it's fiscal deficit, the overall economy in all of these dimensions is on an improving trend. GDP is, uh, after the COVID, has bounced back to 7 to 6.8 levels. Uh, you have the fiscal deficit trending down from a 9.2 during the COVID crisis to about 6.4. You have inflation coming down core CPI to about 6.5, 7. And the projections for next year I will show in a little bit. And all the three sectors are in a positive growth territory. Agriculture being the slowest, followed by manufacturing, and services continues its strong single-digit growth. When you now take it from the economic survey and look at what the indicators are telling about the next few months and the economic activity tracker, which Morgan Stanley Research provides, uh, a clear indication of the direction of the gross value addition in the economy. And you can see that for the next few months, this tracker, the line in blue, clearly shows an uptick. So we can expect the GDP numbers for the rest of this year to also hold good. Similarly, the uh, purchase manufacturing index, right? Purchase manager index, which is both services and for uh, uh, manufacturing are showing a healthy trend of an uptrend and are trending well above 50. So indicates that the economy is in a growing phase and not a degrowth phase, right? You also have the inflation trending lower, vegetable, Prices have been significantly lower on the back of good monsoon, and you've had a good rabi ha harvest also this year. So in the coming year, as you would have seen from the RBI governor's policy also, he expects inflation to trend around 5.3. We've shown a range between 5.2 to 5.7 for the CPI and the core CPI here, right? Uh, the other good news is that economic uh, activity is leading to unemployment coming down. You can see right at the end, rural, urban, and overall unemployment has started trending further down. We also have the health of the corporate sector in terms of the credit ratio of upgrades to downgrades showing a very strong positive after going below one during COVID to five to five and a half. Things for every company getting downgraded, for more than five companies are getting upgraded. So naturally, this is also seen in the bank's uh, NPL ratio, both gross NPLs, and restructured loans, both are showing a declining. So, and banks also are feeling the effect of a good, strong bounce back in credit, right? So that's again, August well, which means that there's good growth in the economy. So to, overall, the news on the Indian economy just before the budget was of a good picture for the Indian economy. How does this compare to the world? And you got the IMF publishing the data just about a week, 10 days ago, which shows that from 2021, 22, expectation for 23 and projection for 24, Indian economy is going to be the fastest growing country in the world. In fact, China, which is 5.2 this year, is going to go down to 4.5 in the year 24. 
and in the advanced economies us and eurozone are actually going to be at a very low single digit one and one and a half percent kind of a growth rate so a slowing world but a growing india that's the message from this so this is the basis on which the union budget was prepared and before i delve into the union budget i'd like to point out that people look at the budget from their own eyes a middle class looks at it from a taxation corporates look at it from whatever capital market participants look at it differently but ultimately as the finance minister the role of the budget is to present a good picture of india both as a snapshot of the year gone by and uh, setting out what you are going to do for the year in the eyes of the rate agents the important thing to remember because ultimately this is a state of the crisis and we are dependent on foreign capital who in turn are dependent on rating agencies risk rating of india so absolutely critical for india's continued growth from a perspective of financing the growth and hence a lot of budget data are essentially geared towards presenting a good picture of a country from a rating agency's perspective so using that mirror first let's remember that the union budget has a political context to it what is the political context yes elections are next year but that budget is going to be a vote on account or an interim budget so if the government wants to do anything with regards to pleasing the vote bank last budget is available number number 2 is not just about next year's election there are a bunch of states going for election karnataka chatisgarh rajasthan telangana madhya pradesh among the important big states and among the smaller states you have mizoram you have tripura you have nagaland you have meghalaya so these state elections are also vote bank so the fear among a lot of the participants who watched the budget was that is this the last opportunity to do some giveaways which is not a healthy from an economy perspective for the long term so that was a worry leading into the budget right so let's remember that point of view and then look at the budget mathematics so this slide gives you the summary the first line gives you the nominal gdp in absolute terms not the gdp growth rates so there it's telling you that we are going to become and just a sense these are rupees billion so when i say billion when you look at data in the next few slides the first comma and the second comma you can see two commas there so this is in billion but for you to understand easily the first number which you see 301751 is nothing but 301 lakh crores so take this data as reading that comma the data before the comma and after the comma is just lakh crores the other word for lakh crores which are now increasingly being used in the uh, finance markets dictionary is the trillion so you can say that india has reached a 300 trillion rupee mark in nominal gdp in 2024 i think the historic first and we should be very very achieving uh, you know clear about the fact that a big milestone is being achieved this year of a 300 lakh crore total gdp size number 1 number 2 is the growth rate in the nominal gdp that has been forecast and as you can see i have circled the data in all of the subsequent slides you can see that i'm circling the data that you need to see because there's a lot of data and while the slides on the screen you may tend to look at everything and get a bit lost just focus around the circled ones so the 10 and a half percent tells you what the finance minister has said that my next year's real gdp plus inflation will turn out to be the last year the the columns let me explain to you the first column is the financial year 21 22 this is a last year's completed year the next column tells you financial year 22 23 be means budget estimate so when nirmala madam presented the budget last year these were the expected numbers she had put into the budget document the next column is the same year but re which is revised estimates which is for the 10 months up to january what are the numbers actually have turned out so this can be a reasonable based on which they are projected for the next two months so that you get a full year picture right and then of course it's what this year's budget carries about the 23 24 year so if you see last year we grew at 15.4% this year we projecting only 10 and a half percent why 
naturally we expect inflation to trend lower but what nirmala madam has done is to take a very conservative number for the real gdp growth so i just showed you that the rbi's projection was somewhere between 5.2 to 5.3 for inflation which means she has only taken 5.2% 10.5 minus 5.3 is only 5.2% gdp growth whereas you saw that the imf for 2021 is projecting 6.1 for india so she has taken extremely conservative numbers in both in growth and in inflation so the budget makes a good start because what is this trying to say let me under promise and over deliver let me build confidence in the rating agency's mind that i will definitely be able to exceed this by the year unless something very bad happens so that's a very comforting thing to take a very moderate reasonable projection right and then i draw your attention to the very last line so up the budget uh, given the total receipts and total expenditure in rupees terms and then in the last in percentage year on year increase so you can see that receipts are going up year on year by 11.7% so slightly faster than the nominal gdp growth rate but expenditure is coming down to 7.5% so this is very important the second goal that the budget scores from a rating in this perspective is that i am forecasting a decline in my expenditure i am controlling my expenditure so good positive sign now the same data i have presented as a percentage of gdp because if the some numbers look higher is it more than the normal gdp growth so the total receipts are at 9% of gdp last year actuals were 8.9 so this kept the receipts exactly at the same percentage of gdp and expenditure she has reduced it from 15.3 to 14.9 as a result most talked about number in the gdp is a fiscal deficit as a percentage of gdp which i had like to highlight two things first last year in the budget we promised 6.4 in the revised estimate we are saying 6.4 so first our credibility builds up to say when i say that i have achieved that second this year is that she is projecting a drop of 50 basis points from 6.4 to 5.9 again something rating is is love to hear that you are going on the path of fiscal discipline in fact not only for this year for the subsequent year she is projected 4.5 a further glide path indicating a decline in the fiscal deficit so so far whatever numbers are presented are very heartening from a rating agency's perspective and a very positive thing right so now when you look at the income from the budget and the expenditures right the income where does income so on the left hand side of this rupee pie chart are the taxation so income tax 15% excise 7 another 22 corporate tax another 15 37 and gst and other taxes 17 so 54% more than half of the government's receipts are coming from the taxation regime then bottom right non tax receipts like disinvestments and others are accounting for another 10 12% i have also put customs here you can take customs as very well to the taxation side the rest comes from borrowing that gap between the deficit right fiscal deficit is a gap between revenue and expenditure that is to be satisfied by borrowing and that's one third of the financing of the budget so one third is by borrowing and close to two third is by taxation with a small little bit coming from other capital flows right now we will go a bit deeper into the taxation thing so the story on receipts is that there are two heads here in receipts there's a revenue receipt and a capital receipt right <laughs> to take the revenue receipts the tax number right i would draw your attention to what i have circled which is 23 lakh crores 23306 is the total tax receipts right now those as a percentage of gdp are just 7.7 versus 7.6 in their revised estimates so the income projection from revenue receipts is roughly the same percentage of gdp as last year when you take a year on year increase you can see that it's about 11.7 as against a 10.5% nominal gdp growth, slightly more than the nominal gdp growth now let's break up this taxation revenue into its components right so taxes are broken up into direct taxes within which you have corporate tax and income tax and then indirect taxes which are customs excise service and gst 
So now again, looking at the circle numbers, the nominal GDP was 10 and a half. The direct taxes are growing at 10 and a half percent. The indirect taxes are growing at 10.4. So clearly the projections are not unrealistic. Whatever nominal GDP we are projecting, we are taking the same for both direct taxes and indirect taxes. So again, the believability of the budget stands. Right, And then if you see the total tax collections are also 10.4, though net they are 11.7, government is giving away slightly less to the state governments from its income and is getting a little more to itself. That's why this is 11.7. So, so far, so good. All the budget numbers look realistic and on target to be achieved. This is the tax perspective. Now, within the tax, you saw that indirect taxes were GST. So these numbers are all the GST related taxes put together. The projection for next year, which you saw there, let me take you back, for GST is at 12% and for total indirect is at 10.5%. How achievable is this? If you look at it, GST collections are already touching an average for the current year of 1,500 lakh, right? It's billion dollars, you're seeing that. So from that 1.5 million, the projection for the thing, if you see in the previous, right, in absolute terms in taxation, is nothing but revenue tax, if you look at it, total is only 23 lakh crores. So if you see there, the GST component will be roughly equal to the tax, individual tax component. So this number looks achievable. So it's not a challenge from the expected GST because also the government is doing a strong compliance drive on the GST part, right? And historically, the data shows that taxes have generally grown with nominal GDP growth. Right. Further, you saw a small component called capital receipts. That's where disinvestment comes in. And we've been very conservative with taking only 60,000 crores as the disinvestment corpus for this year, roughly the same as last year. And there are a host of three or four companies, Concor, BML, Shipping Corporation of India, and NMDC, which will be disinvested. So easily this target is also going to be achievable. Right. And the gap, the 34% of the borrowing. Here also, the finance minister has scored another goal in the sense that the gross borrowings have gone up, but they've gone up only to meet increased repayments, which were 3 lakh crore last year to 3.6 lakh crore. So her net market borrowings are going up by about 7 lakh crore. So roughly the repayments is the only reason she's taking extra money. But the total debt to GDP for India now, this table tells you that for the leading countries of the world, and I've circled India in the middle. So in 2005, we were 81% of GDP. We have grown to 84% of our GDP as our borrowing. 3% increase. But this is one of the smallest increases in a time when the world has been going profligate. Japan went from 174% of GDP to 63%. America has gone from 66% to 128%. UK has gone from 39% to 95%. France has also has gone from 67 to 120 So when all the world countries have been increasing their borrowing, India has been very cautious and careful to keep its borrowing with less than 100%. So first point you have to remember is that this discipline in the borrowing is one of the biggest strengths for our country. Second aspect. Yes, we are less, but if you see within the emerging market, we appear to be the third highest. So it's not like we are very, if you see after Brazil and China, India is the third highest in terms of debt. But the good point of this 84% debt is that the silver lining that I've written in the middle of the paragraph there is that it's largely domestic funded with a significant share being held by local banks and the Reserve Bank of India. So from that point of view, the risk of default is very less because all the government needs to do to pay domestic debt is to print more money. Right? So the question of default on domestic debt will never arise. But the point of this in numbers will tell you how well our Reserve Bank and the government have been running our government. Because if you take the top 12 countries in the world by size of GDP, but India is currently at the 12th rank, you can see there that, that fifth rank India is of the top 12, our external debt to GDP is only 0.62 trillion and is only 17.6% of our GDP. So that also we are the second. 
So we are the lowest international borrower and in relative to our GDP, we are the second lowest international borrower. So why is this good? Because when you borrow from foreigners, you can't print money. You have to buy dollars in the world and the dollar has appreciated, you end up paying far more. So the risk of default is significant the higher the borrowing on external debt. So we have been very prudent in running our country in a very safe manner. And only 17.6% of our GDP is external debt and $0.62 trillion is only the total value of the same. right? And if this year's base case 10% goes through, we'll continue to be at 84% of GDP. If the nominal growth comes at 12%, which is quite likely, then you will see that there'll be a trend of the debt going down to about 82%. Right? So you just talked about the inflows into the budget. right? Let's talk about where the expenditure goes. Why? The inflows help finance the expenditure. It's the expenditure which gives the boost to the economy. It is the expenditure which is also the reason for the deficit being there. Right? The expenses are higher than the income. The third thing is that you got to see is that the greater the uh, rupees expenditure is on certain elements, you will find that the rating agencies are much more comfortable with the fiscal deficit that we have versus if we do it in some other. I will explain that in a bit of detail. right? So here, I just want to point out from this pie chart that in our expenditure, something which the government can't control is the interest cost of funds already borrowed, right? that 84% of GDP. That takes up 20% just interest payments. So that's the single big figure that I want to point out to you. Now we will go into some of these items in great detail. So let's look at the story on expenditure. I broadly divided the expenditure into revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. So like earlier, I have circled the relevant data as a percentage of GDP. Our revenue expenditure is one percentage points less than the revised estimate of last year. Whereas our capital expenditure is going up from 2.7% of GDP to 3.3% of GDP. In fact, we are almost flat at 1.2% year on year growth in revenue, but 37% increase in the capital expenditure. From the way I've been talking, it's very clear that capital expenditure is a desirable thing, whereas revenue expenditure is something unavoidable, but should be controlled. So now when you look at the key elements of revenue expenditure, how has the government achieved the decrease? Because they have reallocated this money according to the need and what they've taken some very tough decisions by reducing the food subsidy to FCI under the National Food Security Act from 2 lakh crores to 1.3 lakh crores, a 36% decrease. The Narega scheme also comes down from 89,000 crores to 60,000 crores, 33% decrease. And the food for decentralized producement of food grains also comes down by 17% from 72,000 crores to 60,000 crores. So all the revenue expenditure the government is controlling, only one it is increasing, which is the uh, JAL, National Drinking Water Mission, is going up from 55,000 crores to 70,000 crores because this has a more permanent impact on the people of the rural people of India, right? So overall, very conservative on the revenue. And the reason that... Uh, revenue expenditure should be controlled is because the impact is very less, but the pain is very more in future years when you have to repay these. right? So from that point of view, if you see India, the blue bars are the revenue expenditure, the yellow are the capital expenditure. right? They were on a rising trend last year, post-COVID. Right. Now overall expenditure is trending down. And the ratio also is coming down as seen very clearly in this. So our revenue to capex ratio has dropped from 6.5% in 2019 to 3.5%. Right? So clearly there's a tilt happening away from revenue to capex in terms of expenditure. Why this focus on capex and infrastructure spending and all of that? Because when you spend on capex, right, the red line tells you the impact that capex spending has on the GDP growth of the country. And the black line tells you what is the 
uh, impact of the uh, uh, other uh, capital expenditure. So, so if you see that capital expenditure in the first six months itself is double of the impact and later it goes to almost two and a half times the impact. So every 1% GDP increase in government capex increase has a stronger impact on quarterly GDP growth than revenue expenditure. Not only that, it also lasts much longer. How much longer? If you look at this, again, I've taken data from the IMF in this table. Every one rupee spent on revenue declines to half X after four and a half quarters, four to five quarters. But every rupee on spent on capex persists even up to 16 quarters in the economy. So CapEx gives a multiplier effect. The reason rating agencies are very comfortable with spending on CapEx because that GDP growth will lead to increased government income and help bring down the fiscal deficit in the future. So CapEx expenditure is a very good quality expenditure from a rating agency's perspective and also from a GDP multiplier effect perspective. So the union budget has ticked all the right boxes. So you didn't see any noise from the rating agencies and market should have celebrated that. We'll come to the market later, right? First, let's look at, I'm sorry, I was going to go to the markets right away. So if you now look at it, what we have covered is a reasonable expected economic performance for the near term. Budget has done nothing to damage it, but just going to promote economic growth to capex multiplier effect. So the first stop you've tackled. Now, when you look at the demand for stocks, also known as valuations or P ratio, comes from foreigners and for domestic, right? So if you now look at who makes a big difference to the stock price, the left-hand side pie chart tells you the current ownership of the Indian stock market. So 45.13% of the Indian stock market is owned by the private promoters. Why do I point this out? Your increase and decrease in stock prices is not because of action from these people. These people don't sell their ownership. If they sell, it is sold in a private deal. Or if they need money, they do a block deal to get money in, right? They do leveraging of their shares to get money in, but they don't go and sell their stake. So in the next table side by side, I have taken the liberty of removing the promoter holding and then calculating the percentages of various types of investors. So now the circle tells you that 37% of the ownership of the free float market cap, removing the private owners is 37%. And domestic mutual fund DMF is 14%. So together, these two control 50% of the market and they decide the price rise and fall in addition, of course, to insurance buying, which is about 60%. So now when you look at the 37% FII money, that's broken up into three bits. If you look at it, sovereign wealth funds and pensioners funds are long-term players. So they don't cause short-term volatility. Whereas the M mutual funds and health funds, mutual funds are active funds, which take a strong overweight or innovate India call. Then you have passive funds, which give India the money in the share of the index. And then you have hedge funds, which are very, very sensitive to news flow around the economy, to currency, to oil, and to all of that. And they are the ones, if you see in the first circle I've shown, accounted for three-fourths of the foreigner outflows between September last year to June, right? So. Whereas sovereign wealth funds tend to allocate money linked to the share of global GDP of India. As you saw, India is now fifth ranked, so we also get a higher share of that money. That's why I call that hot money and this as long-term money, right? Now, the behavior of this is passive funds is based on the allocation in the index. And what this is telling you is that 15.33% of the index is India, which means every 100 rupees, 5 rupees comes to Indian market. So if the retail investor gives money to the ETF, automatically they will come and buy, no questions asked, right? And actually India's allocation has gone up over the years from 6.7% in 10 years ago to 15% plus now, because our economy is in a strong growth mode. Now, these FIIs who pull out and the domestic mutual fund who pull out I have given the table there on the quarterly wise flows starting from the COVID period. So as you can see, the first four quarters, FIs were strong buyers. And then for next two quarters, they brought down the level of buying, right? Whereas domestic industry was selling during that period. What is the reason? First, domestic industry was selling because COVID was bad news. 
lockdowns were happening, GDP growth came down dramatically that quarter, hence they were panicking and they were pulling out their money from the equity markets to mutual funds, right? But foreigners were investing. Why? Because the slowdown in the world economy meant that in the bottom graph, the oil prices crashed right from a 60 odd dollars to a $20 level. This decline in oil price has made them put money. And then when you see oil prices gently started rising in a V shape after that, when it crossed the 80 level, there was a strong trigger for the oil to go to 125, which happened. And that quarter onwards, they pulled out the money for three quarters. Then again, they started coming back when the oil prices started turning down to the rate hike starting in the US. So FII flows is very clearly linked to the oil prices, whereas domestic flows since that period when they came back, domestic flows have been continuously quarter on quarter being positive, right? So I think domestic investors are concerned about domestic economic situation. Foreign investors, the hedge fund types, are more worried about the currency and its impact on India. And this table gives you, lays out, what are the things that would get severely impacted in India in the event oil prices continue to rise? Why? Because India imports in the headline I've given 183, sorry, 83% of its oil. So there are eight solid reasons why FII sell their holdings in India when oil prices are strongly rising. But take a mirror for this. When oil prices are falling, the same eight negatives would become the strong eight positives, right? So that's why money comes in. So if you see FPI flows into India, they are by and large correlated to expectations on oil price movements. Now, the other thing, of course, we mentioned is that insurance is about 16% of the ownership. And in this period, not only domestic mutual funds have totally bought 185, but you have had insurance companies also buying 90,000 crores. So they've given a strong support to the market. Hence, Indian markets volatility compared to the world is significantly lower. Off late in the month of January or what you just picked up, you may know the reasons for that. So I will talk about it when we come to that. So this then gives you the picture that this continuous buying by domestic investors, sporadic with FIIs, has led to a situation in December 15 of an all green market. Sensex, Nifty, mid cap, small cap, 500, everything is positive. But by December 30, the one month return had turned negative because month to date, FIIs sold 3,500. Why this sale took place? This sale took place because year end bonuses for many, many FIIs are calculated on cash profits booked. You cannot show the NAV and take. So they need to book and then redeploy in the month of January if need be. So this is the reason for the correction as of December 30th in the one month return. Now, when you move on to the next year, normally there's a January effect if I has come back. But this time the pullout continued from January 22, January 27, and the next four days of January 31. What happened? This was mainly because of the panic selling by FIIs, which meant that your January end, your three months return also became negative. And the FI pullout was totally about 12,000 crores in this period between December 1st to January 27. Now came the day of the budget. You saw the budget ticked all the right boxes. So there's a budget euphoria. By mid noon, the markets had gone up 1,000 points. But these FIIs, pulled out money from India when the markets rose, bringing down the market because of what? This is the Adani impact on the market. It's too much in the public domain. You can't talk spare stocks with it on the show. So basically is that there was some short seller who put out a negative report on the company. So their stocks are correcting, but also the other stocks also started correcting, which are linked to these pullouts. Right, we'll come to that in a bit. But right now, if you see what happened, is that even on the budget day, FIS came and sold 4,700 crores worth of stocks. So the market reaction to the budget has clearly been distorted by the Adani factor. And hence, from Jan 31st to Feb 1, that number budget day, and then post budget day, you see, quarter to date, FIS have pulled out 35,000 crores. Just this month today, February to now, up to February, they have pulled out 6,000 crores. 
So right now we are going through a situation where the Adani's factor has spooked some of the foreign investors, right? And so when you look at the budget day to now yesterday, you'll also see that the movement is more towards the safety rather than to the risky, right? So if you see the bank index, which is considered the safer index, has gone from one month minus 7.2, minus 2.6 on day. Second, when you look at safety healthcare, minus 3, minus 3.5. IT, 3.1 to 7.9, right? So there's a safety related buyback. And then you take the industrial sector, right? There when you see, right, pretty much similar situation is prevalent. Nothing has changed there. So from that point of view, let's look at the fact of the noise in the market around the valuations, right? You're hearing a lot of noise in the market of the valuations. So I wanted to bring a perspective that FIs have been consistent in West India for more than a decade, only in 2018 and last year for the two negative years. So as a result, this 37.5% ownership of the free float market cap has been prevalent right from 2006 onwards. So they have been a strong holder of just market cap for the last 15, 16 years. So if you now look at it, the text of the composition, you can see that the FIIs, right, and going back to the previous slide, continuously buying, and because if you see sovereign wealth funds and insurance funds, they invested, and you look at the fact that the ETF has 15% share, so when people put money into an ETF, they have to come and buy. You can see that India has traded at a valuation premium for the last 15 years from comparison with world market, the dark blue line, or the gray line, the emerging market. And if you say related to emerging market, effectively, India's MS India P ratio has consistently been at a premium to emerging market. Even within emerging market countries, India is a standout in terms of the valuation premium. Why? Because our growth in a slowing world, you saw the IMO score details, is a much higher, much more consistent growth so FII is considered India to be a growth stock or a growth country in their portfolio. And hence, they have been buying India consistently regardless of the extent of overvaluation of the. So that cannot be a main trigger for such a heavy pullout. In fact, if you look at the valuations from our own long-term perspective, right? Lofty is forward P. The red line gives the long-term average. And I circled at the end to show you that India is today trading at a discount to its own long-term average of 19. It's trading at about 18, 17 and a half. So against our own historic valuation, we are reasonably priced. Against other emerging markets, it's unfair to compare because they are not in a growth phase. We are in a growth phase. The market pays a premium for growth. And further good news that is there from a valuation perspective is that corporate profits have caught up with the GDP in terms of an index earnings grade on a log scale, and they will cross the GDP trend. And if you look at the right-hand side graph, the share of profits in the GDP is likely to make a new high. Corporate profits will be in this. So corporate India is growing much faster than GDP. So if GDP is to go at 6.8 and nominal GDP at 10.5 projected by budget or 11.7 as projected by Reserve Bank of India, we should see the stock market companies make marked greater growth in their profits. Hence, from a valuation perspective, even if you take the broader market of mid-cap, large-cap and this, they're all broadly trading at that kind of a average levels. And hence, if you now look at it from a valuation perspective, right, large-cap versus mid-cap versus small-cap, you'll see that in December 2017, mid-caps were trading at 35% premium to large-caps and small-caps were trading at 11.7. They left number Today, mid cap is trading just equal to the large cap index. The small cap is trading 13% discount to the small cap index. So, arguably, valuation is not a big challenge from this point of view. Hence, from a short term perspective for the Indian market, outlook will be driven purely from a flows perspective. So, what is this flows and what is the timing? So, if you noticed, we had mentioned the linkage with crude. And where is crude today? Crude has come down to 85, but the long-term average of crude is around 60. So as you can see, when does the crude price drop? This table will give you a clue there. World demand for oil hovers around the 100 million barrels per day. 
70 percent of this is supplied by the non-OPEC countries who have to sell all the oil they produce. The balance 30 percent of supply is in the hands of OPEC and they never supply full 30. They keep it below that in order to control the oil price and that's what they've done and kept it at 80. But when you see now and go from the lowest demand, which came during COVID, from 100, it dropped to 91 million barrels. The OPEC could not cut below 26 million barrels, right? So that's the Lakshman Rekha for them. When that happens, then oil prices crash. When will that happen in this year? We think that right now, because of winter demand, OPEC is able to keep the prices high. But once the summer sets in from March, April, we think oil demand weakening with the summer will make the oil prices trend down. And then you can expect a return of the FIIs, those who went out recently. This table gives you a snapshot. We talked about the flows from the COVID time. So the gross FII flows have been 2.82 lakh crores from that period of March 2020 to September 21, the low oil price period. Now, when the prices went high from October to June, what they put their money in one and a half years, in just nine months, they've taken out 80% of that money in 2.56 lakh crores. Then when oil prices started correcting, they brought in another 96,000 crores in from uh, July to December. Now, you saw because of the recent volatility, they have pulled out 35,000 crores. Sorry, these are not million dollars, these are all crore numbers, right? So, Mutual funds, of course, have been net buyers and the cumulative inflow has been positive. But 2.82 lakh crore FM, which was there in our market, is no longer there. So this that difference is 1,95,000 crores of potential FII money, which can come into the Indian market as and when you see a decline in oil prices, which I expect in the roughly the second half of the year. Right. So with that, I think I've taken about 45 plus minutes to talk about the uh, short term economy, to talk about the budget's impact and to talk about the short term market. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.